Morning guys, Dr. Gillard here. This is week two, spring of 2020. This is CVPP lab, cardiovascular pulmonary pathology lab number two. Here we go for the second week. Oh, what are we talking about? We're gonna, very important today. This is a little longer than usual, but this is an important exam because you'll be treating a lot of patients with sciatica and you wanna make sure it's not some other problem. So examination of the lower extremities and the key pulses. Why is the lower extremity exam important? Well, sciatica can mimic, or I don't want to say, other conditions can mimic, mimic sciatica and completely fake you out, like deep vein thrombosis, notorious for faking people out. And so I can testify to that, first-hand knowledge of that. So let's go through it. There are other causes of radicular pain besides sciatica. DVT, deep vein thrombosis, is a big one, a dangerous one. But PAD, peripheral artery disease, we'll talk about that in class, but what is it? It's basically atherosclerotic plaquing that's clogged up some really big pipes like the abdominal aorta. Common iliac arteries get so clogged up with gunk, atherosclerotic plaque, that it starts to act as a beaver dam, and you get a decreased flow downstream, and yeah, so that can decrease the pulses just like a beaver dam would. A vitamin B12 deficiency could do the trick as well. We'll learn in GIGU about that, uh, but you need vitamin B12 to make myelin which surrounds sheath. Myelin has to be replaced. If you start to lose your myelin and can't replace it, your nerves, your nerves short circuit and can cause pain. Multiple sclerosis is another demyelinating disease that can cause leg pain. So just because it's sciatica, don't immediately assume it's sciatica from a disc herniation or spinal stenosis or lateral stenosis. Small fiber neuropathies can do it, like diabetes or AIDS. Uh, that's also demyelinating disease, can short-circuit the nerves and present with pain, usually bilateral pain, but not always. Lyme's disease, another demyelinating disease. Deep vein thrombosis, we already said, uh, but there it is again, it's so important. So as with any exam, you start out inspecting. So we're going to inspect the skin of the lower extremities. First thing you want to look is down by the ankles, that's called the gator area. You want to inspect for some color changes. The it makes you know take their socks off, take their pants off, put them in a gown. Don't um, you know? I won't go into the story, but I had somebody sued over something like this. We didn't do a good neurological exam and it got them in trouble. So take the time, and once you have them in their in their, um, so you can look at their legs and their feet. They should be the same color. They shouldn't be purplish unless it's freezing cold in your office. They shouldn't be pyloric or pallor. Um, that is. A white color. Well, look at that. And it sh they shouldn't be, one shouldn't be really red. That's a sign of a DVT if one is erythemic and one is not. Or uh, things like chronic regional pain syndrome, which is rare but can happen. Uh, dark skinned individuals, kind of tough to assess them. So, pallor, that is like pallor is like a ghost like color. It means the tissue is not getting enough blood flow. So loss of local blood flow specifically through the dermal capillaries through the dermis is not supplied with blood. So your, your skin starts to become kind of white looking. And remember there's a dermal capillary system and a dural venous plexus. You may not be familiar with that, but that's what drains the capillaries or what drains, what drains the dermis. Okay. Uh, and it could, if it, if the tissue becomes really ischemic, it starts to turn purple, and that's, that's a dangerous sign that you're killing the tissue. So it could occur in local regions where there's a upstream artery supplying a clog, so you have a beaver dam somewhere upstream, and therefore, let's say it's in your popliteal vessel artery, and you get a beaver dam there, you might have decreased blood flow down into your foot, and your leg and foot start to look white because of the decreased blood flow. What's a beaver dam? Maybe it's a blood clot. Uh, maybe it's a tumor compressing the wall of the vessel. Conditions which decrease oxygen content through the blood, like let's say a, oh, how about a, 
Um, let's see, patent ductus arteriosus. No, let's, how about a ventricular septal defect? We'll do it quicker. Yeah, so you're losing your oxygenated blood. It's being pumped into your deoxygenated blood, so you have a decreased oxygen content. Your whole body can start looking a little white. You're going to have other symptoms, right? A little bit dizziness and things like that because of that. Uh, but, yeah, and that, of course, can go on to cyanosis as well. Just to remind you, there's the epidermis. It's no blood. We, we usually don't see, we see the arteries up in here, but we haven't seen the venous system. But there is a venous system uh, here. So, yeah, it's the same as the arterial system. There's reticular system that feeds the deep system. And these are the deep veins. This is how the blood will lead. We'll learn more specifically in lecture, but that's how deep blood gets out. It's drained out of the superficial kind of component or compartment, so to speak. It goes into a perforator system that's transferred down to the deep. There's a reticular system, etc. We'll talk about that more in class. So what are some of the causes of extremity pallor? Well, we just said compression of an artery. So that's a beaver dam. So downstream, you get a decreased flow, and therefore you'll get a decreased color. What can cause a beaver dam in an artery? Well, a tumor outside pushing into it. Uh, you could get a inside the pipe, you could get a clot, a blood clot, that's broken loose from somewhere else. You can get an adjacent lymph node. One of the inguinal lymph nodes, superficial or deep, gets really big. It can compress the, uh, the femoral artery or the external iliac artery, whichever, if it's above the inguinal ligament. And yeah, that can cause a beaver dam. Or maybe swelling, tissue swelling can start to clamp down on an artery as well. These are all beaver dams. See how important our little beaver friend is? Uh, stenosis of an artery, so clogging up of the inner lumen of the artery. We're going to talk about Berger's disease, peripheral artery disease. We already said that, but we can say it again. Vasculitis, you can get autoimmune attack of the tunic intima intim of a blood vessel, and that can swell up the blood vessel to the, the point it pinches off the flow of blood. Cyanosis is uh, pallor, pallor, usually well, it doesn't usually, hopefully it won't, but it can get into a more serious condition, and that's called cyanosis, uh, where your tissue is screaming for oxygen. You're probably going to almost start getting pain at this point because the tissue is so hungry for oxygen. Uh, oxygen, hemoglobin, um, yeah, are lacking. Uh, it'll first show up in the gums. You can, people of color, you can check their gums because it might not show up in their skin, uh, but the inside of their lip, uh, their ears will start being affected. So you can look for it. Uh, global cyanosis is not a good thing. Probably the most common condition is a respiratory failure. COPD, the end stage, is where they just can't get enough oxygen into their blood. Or maybe the end stages of our uh, latest world nemesis, COVID-19. Same thing, the end stages of that are respiratory failure. So not a good thing. Now, it could be maybe you're hand could get cyanotic without your whole body and that would be from some type of beaver dam upstream or it could be from peripheral artery disease or uh, burger's disease as we said anything that acts as a beaver dam and constricts the flow of blood downstream the tissue downstream is going to be affected and start to turn pyloric at first and then cyanotic right where we said this slide i think respiratory failure Congenital heart anomalies, we'll talk about these soon. Uh, VSD, ASD, atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect. Um, hypothermia, maybe the patient it's just got out of, or maybe they just, it's freezing outside and they didn't wear a coat and they're frozen. Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning uh, can do it, uh, although it starts to turn that cherry red color too after a while, but it still can do it. Isolated causes of cyanosis, um, anything that causes a beaver dam again, right? So uh, emboli, what, I don't, these are like duplicate slides. Right? I think I've said all this stuff. I can pull some of these out of here. So let's move on to erythema. Actually, let me write down a note. Get rid of slide 15, get that out. Uh, if skin receives too much, oh, I better, I'll leave it in because that'll mess up the slide order here. Uh, if skin receives too much blood flow, 
Then the opposite can happen. Too many red blood cells underneath the skin and the dermis can actually make the skin look red. And that's called erythema. So two main causes of erythema. Excessive vasodilation of the microcirculation. Okay, that makes sense. So the opposite of a beaver dam. The pipes have been opened too much and too much blood flow is coming in. Might even get some swelling with that. But uh, here's the one that people forget about. Venous stasis. You can get a beaver dam. Uh, but now how can a beaver dam cause redness, too much blood flow in the microcirculation and under the skin? Well, if the beaver dam is further down the pipe system, uh, if it's in the veins somewhere, like the deep veins, uh, you get a beaver dam there. Remember, beaver dams, you get a decreased flow downstream, but you get an increase back up upstream, and that causes venous stasis. And that can also uh, cause erythema because the blood gets, gets driven out of the capillaries into the interstitial fluid, and it starts to show up as red in color. So that's another mechanism. Excessive vasodilation, so... Uh, that's too much into the tissue, so decrease sympathetic tone. What if somehow you injure your sympathetic system and nitric oxide then rules the roost? Well, you, all your microcirculation will open too much and you get too much blood flow into the area which will show up as red. Maybe you've just been out in the sun and you can. everybody knows you stay out in the sun too long, you get hot. How come? Because your microcirculation opens up and under the dermis and you can see all that extra blood is red. Excessive release of histamine. Anybody's got springtime or fall allergies, uh, got them bad, can tell you they get red around their eye because histamine opens up the microcirculation. It's a little more detailed than that, but uh, and it causes too much blood into the area and you get red. A blockage of downstream. So here's the beaver dam. Let's go back to that beaver dam in the, uh, the lower extremity system. Uh, so downstream beaver dam causes increased hydrostatic pressure in the upstream capillaries, right? Because the capillaries are upstream uh, from the deep vessels, the capillaries around the ankles, we'll say. They're upstream from the deep vessels, let's say your popliteal vein. Yeah. And so you get a you get a beaver dam in the popliteal vein, a blood clot, and it can back up and cause swelling, and it can cause redness and warmth even around your gator area. Right? So downstream beaver dam causes increased hydrostatic pressure. Excessive pressure inhibits the return of blood flow. Yep. And it builds up, causes swelling and erythema. Everything I get said. Uh, and we can go a step further. You can actually start to get some, uh, because of all the swelling, the, the epidermal cells can't get enough food and they start dying. And when they start dying, the, the body's immune system needs to clean. And so you come in there and you get an inflammation of the skin, and that's a stasis dermatitis. It's just a dermatitis or cellulitis. Uh, why? Because you have a beaver dam somewhere way upstream in the deep vessels. Here's a patient who had a DVT, came into the ER, said, I think something's wrong with me, normal skin color. This is swollen and red. How come? Uh, because he's got a big thrombosis, which has clogged up the blood vessel, and he can't get any blood out of his leg. We'll learn that 85% of the blood leaves through the deep system, and 15% leaves through the superficial system. So therefore, you don't get good blood flow out of your lower extremity and it starts to looking a little bit red because of that backup. Sympathetic nerve injury, you get a disruption of the sympathetics. Kind of said this. Um, and we know sympathetics are responsible for vasoconstriction, but if you lose your sympathetics, there goes vasoconstriction, nitric oxide rules. And you get red looking. You become erythemic. Uh, the other thing with sympathetic nerve injury we, we didn't mass mention is a loss of sweating. Uh, so you get anhydrosis or hypohydrosis. No sweating or decreased sweating. That We can't really see that. That has to be tested by a neurologist. But I guess we could test it if we wanted to. But um, yeah, that's a sympathetic nerve injury. Uh, so... Uh, there's all kinds of things that can 
Parkinson's disease. There's all kinds of damaging uh, diseases that attack the ANS that could cause it. Uh, you could have following a surgery because some of the sympathetics run in the big, the big nerve, the sciatic nerve. Uh, has sympathetics in it. All the big peripheral nerves have sympathetic fibers. So if you damage those, you could get a sympathetic reaction. I can tell you firsthand because I got some sympathetic damage from a failed discectomy. And my leg uh, below the knee is always a little bit redder. When I got out of the surgery, it was like a rock lobster red. Uh, very unusual. I don't know what went on during that surgery, but completely screwed me up. And it's rare, though. It doesn't happen. I have, you know, I talk to, to people all screwed up all the time on my kind of side business, and maybe only once or twice a year out of hundreds of people I talk to have this condition. So it is pretty rare. We'll look at real quickly. I took most of the uh, the CRPS slides. I just, I, but then I had to put a couple back in. I just couldn't take them all out. So this problem is called chronic regional pain syndrome. It used to be called RSD, or reflex sympathetic dystrophy. They reclassified it because there's two types. There's a CPRS1 and CPRS2. The CPRS1 uh, follows a simple sprain strain of the ankle uh, or a fracture of the hand. It's just a run-of-the-mill musculoskeletal injury. Then all this weird sympathetic stuff happens afterwards. And then CPRS2 is what I have, damaged peripheral nerve. Uh, from Classically, it happens from Saturnite palsy where you fall asleep on the bench and your radial nerve gets compressed as you're in a drunk stupor. Uh, it tends to occur after that. But it can occur after any type of injury, including an a injury to the sciatic nerve roots. And yeah, it's a really, really rare disorder. And it's strange. It it's damage and how it how it works we don't understand. Phase one is pretty easy to understand because that's a flat out injury to the sympathetics. So in the early stage, you get sympathetic related injury or deficit. So you're going to get erythema, so redness of the affected area. In my case, the entire lower extremity, mostly below my knee, though. Uh, it'll be warmth to the touch. There will be no sweating there. Um, can't test that really. But sensitivity is the key. Super sensitive. I couldn't even wear a sock for a long time. Uh, I couldn't put socks on. They hurt. I had allodynia. You can hardly touch it. Um, hyperalgesia is like if you just kind of run your fingers over to test sensation. That irritates it. So too sensitive to things that shouldn't hurt you. Allodynia is nothing can touch it, not even a sock, not even bed sheets. Um, so really, really strange condition. Later, now mine, thank goodness, and they don't all go to this phase, but some people go into this weird thing and they think it's got something to do with the brain, but it's like the sympathetics come back on with a vengeance and then everything is reversed. Too much sympathetics means your skin is pyloric and even cyanotic. And the marco remarkable thing about late chronic regional pain syndrome is you sweat like crazy. So let's look at this patient. So, uh, so this is interesting. This is classic late CRPS, the weird stage. So she, she fractured I believe it was a fracture to the metacarpal. Two metacarpals casted. Things were going normal. Uh, but just after they took the cast off, all of a sudden it went through stage one. Uh, it got super red, hot to the touch. She couldn't put a glove on. She couldn't do anything because of this thing. Uh, and then with the passage of time, the other hand started the same thing. This is a problem with the brain with the sympathetics. Um, a really weird thing. And then she started sweating more and more and more. And now she's constantly sweating because the sympathetics are going full blast. So you probably, I've never seen one of these in my career. Uh, but I have seen, uh, beside myself, I've seen two other cases uh, during my uh, 25, I was active practice for 25 years. I've seen two cases, big industrial clinics. So we saw a lot of injuries and we had two, uh, an ankle and a wrist. Uh, they never got this bad, though, but they went into the first stage. So the other thing you have to, we're inspecting, we're still looking at the lower extremities. The other thing you have to watch out for are signs that they have venous insufficiency. That means their valves are wrecked in their lower extremity, and they, they constantly have too much pressure down by the gator areas or by the ankle areas. 
And how do we know that? Uh, this guy doesn't look swollen at all. It's because he was in the hospital and he was off his feet and the swelling is gone. But most of the time when he's a grocery checker, he's on his feet all the time, especially if he doesn't wear compression stockings, he's always swollen. And what happens uh, is the blood the pressure can get so high in the microcirculation it drives red blood cells out into the interstitium where they can't live and they crenate, they explode uh, and they release hemosiderin which is a brown, it's like getting a tattoo from the inside out and you start getting a permanent brown stain there and that is a sign of chronic venous insufficiency. If your patient comes in and their leg, you see these on their legs and they have sciatica, let's say it's just in one leg they have sciatica here. Now, even if it is in both legs, you have to be very careful to make sure the sciatica is for real and it's not a blood clot. Okay, other signs of chronic venous insufficiency. So, I mean, if it gets really bad, you can see the hemosiderin here uh, in the past, but the hemosiderin has, now we're getting cell death here because it, the, the, the pressure is getting so high, these cells can't get feed, fed, and they start dying, and you get an inflammation to clean them up, and you can get an open wound from this. So again, another sign of venous ulcers, another sign of, of chronic venous insufficiency. Switching gears, sometimes we get weird circular lesions. Those are called alopecia. Alopecia errata. Errata means the most common form of a disease. So there's different types. We won't get it. We'll talk more about it in seventh quarter. Um, but yeah, you get these crop circles. And it is associated with autoimmune diseases like hyperthyroidism and, and things like that. And general hair loss can be sci uh, also. Maybe he doesn't have any hair. And, and, and as you get old, old age, uh, you tend to lose hair in your lower extremities anyway. So that's not uncommon. Um, but someone young who used to be hairy and all of a sudden they're not hairy, maybe they have hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, some other uh, disease that's attacking. Some types of alopecia, uh, alopecia universalis, you lose your hair all over the place. And again, they think it's an autoimmune type disease. Talk about that more in seventh quarter. Uh, look for muscle atrophy. Okay, now this is really, really important. I had a friend, I won't tell the story, but I had a friend sued over this because he didn't bother getting a tape measure and measuring the girths of the patient's lower extremities. Uh, so look at the Look at the gastrocnemius. Have them stand up. Uh, look at the hamstrings. Look at the quads. And then get your darn measuring tape out and measure. Uh, this should be mandatory in the clinic. Why it isn't, I don't know. Uh, if you're going to treat workers' comp patients in California, you app, this is mandatory. You have to get uh, measurements and, and get a baseline. Why? What if you're treating someone with a disc herniation and it's compressing uh, the nerve roots that make up the sciatic nerve? Let's say the S1 root that goes to the calf. Fresh injury, they just got sciatica. You come in, you measure their calves, and they're both, oh, let's say, 18 inches in diameter. Okay, great. So you're treating the patient. A month goes by, you do a re-exam. Patient's really not much better. Maybe they're even a little bit better, but you treat them. And now the sciatic leg, let's say it's the left leg, now they're 16 inches and the other one is still 17. They've lost an inch. And you look at them and, yep, sure enough, they have atrophy. And then the wife goes, you know, when he gets out of the shower, his gluteal muscle, it's also S1, it looks really flabby. That The patient's not going. You've got to refer immediately uh, to a spine surgeon and get an MRI uh, before they see the spine surgeon, or the spine surgeon will be irritated. That's just a waste of time. So get that MRI because they're not doing well. It's one of the few things that can m make a discectomy mandatory is progressive motor loss. So super important uh, measuring. All right, so palpation. Now we're done observing. Now it's palpate. Uh, so you can, if people of color, <clears throat> where you can't see, you might just use the back of your hands and run the back of your hands up their legs to see if they're hot because maybe you can't see the erythema, right? <clears throat> maybe they're super cold. You should note to see if they're super cold too. Cigarette smokers tend to have not great circulation. People with pad don't have great circulation. We'll show you a test for that. Uh, maybe they're really nervous. Their sympathetics are turned on. <clears throat> that can do it too. <clears throat> Sorry, i got to take <laughs> my voices hanging in there, but did a lot of videos yesterday, and it's, I'm not going to have time to fix that, so sorry. 
So <clears throat> unilateral cold feet, what's the deal with that? Well, they they got a beaver. If it's only one foot that's cold, um, they got a beaver dam not downstream from the, not in the venous circulation, but upstream somewhere in the artery. Uh, so they're not getting a lot of blood. And it's getting cold. It's going to be pyloric, might even be cyanotic. But yeah, it's the same things we talked about uh, that cause pallor. So a blood clot in the arteries. And these are arterial problems. They're not vein problems. Veins are are downstream from the the capillaries and circulation of the feet. The arteries are upstream. So um, a tumor compressing, the same things we said before, trauma to the blood vessel, vasculitis, pad, Berger's disease. We already talked about those. Okay, so get out your measuring tape. I forgot to, I was going to, I keep saying I'm going to do this. And I had a, I didn't put this on our video today, but oh my goodness, that's not very hard. You just measure the thickest part of the calf, take three measures, measure the thickest part of the other calf, take three measures, Write it down and keep an eye on it. Simple as that. Same thing with the arms. If they have cervical radicular pain going down their arms, uh, then you want to measure their forearms at the thickest part and their biceps at the thickest part. The quadriceps, you can measure depending on how tall they are. Pick a measure so it's um, it's just above the vas the little teardrop, the vastus medialis. Uh, so you get kind of in between there. Uh, usually, well, it depends how big they are, but write down how far you measured up uh, and then make the measurement because, I mean, if you measure down here or you measure up here, the thigh is going to be way different, so you have to make, you have to uh, pick a spot. Um, seven inches is kind of a lucky seven. That's what we used in our clinic just to remember, unless they're really tall, but the key is just to write it down. Get those darn girth measurements so you can keep an eye uh, if, if if they're true Radiculopathy, if it's getting worse, it's going to shrink. All right, uh, check for signs of edema. We already talked about that. Um, always take three measures. The thing you have to be careful with measuring, though, you have to make sure that they don't have swelling. Because if they have swelling in one leg, then the other leg is going to be too skinny. So you have to rule out swelling by doing some checking for pitting edema. Um, and we, we f I do that in a different video because this one's getting too long, but we have that coming up uh, in two weeks. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk more about this lower extremity exam. We're going to do blood pressure next week because you have CCP exams, although you don't have it this quarter. I guess I could go back to normal order. Um, yeah, everything I said. Uh, positive findings. So what would cause unilateral atrophy? I like to ask this question in the midterms. What would cause you unilateral or which one of the following is not a cause of, uni, of unilateral atrophy? Radiculopathy. What is radiculopathy? You guys should know by now. No, it's not, a, it's not pain running down their leg. That's radiculitis. Radiculopathy means you've done a neurological exam and you've found sensory loss, you found motor loss, you found weakness, um, any of those things. Okay, um, so yeah, radiculopathy from spinal stenosis, a disc herniation, uh, facet cyst, those are probably the three most common things, could be rare tumor or something. Uh, but yeah, that'll shrink up because the nerve's damaged, the nerve's not supplying the muscle and the muscle fibers are dying. Uh, neuropathy, maybe it's not at the spine level, maybe it's Oh, popliteal nerve, or the common peroneal nerve that got hit, or the tibial nerve that got compressed from a tumor or from an injury. Um, that can also cause atrophy because the nerve plugs into the muscles. If the nerve is damaged, the muscles, some of the muscle cells die. How about a bilateral, um, bilateral lower extremity edema? I don't even need to go there, right? We did a whole lecture on that yesterday. Uh, but what if they look swollen both legs what could that be from think heart liver kidneys lung disease all of those can cause uh, act as a beaver dam in the respective ways some of them beaver dams some of them loss of albumin um, so either lost albumin or beaver dam can relate uh, cause swelling we, we talk see my lectures for those uh, some drugs can do it uh, 
Calcium channel blockers can cause general swelling. Sometimes people swell and they don't can never figure out what it is. Unilateral swelling, uh, CRPS would be kind of rare, but it can happen. Uh, deep vein thrombosis, where there's a beaver dam in the deep, and you get erythema and swelling. Uh, maybe you had a arthritis or ankle injury, and it's you have some effusion and not swelling. All right, let's get to palpation. I have a video on this stuff. So what are you feeling for uh, RRA, rate, rhythm, and amplitude? How fast is the pulse going? Is it normal pulse? And some will talk about pulses paradoxus, where uh, it you can feel a pulse, but every time the patient breathes in, it disappears. That's weird. And we'll talk about that. And then the amplitude, is it pounding like he just ran around the block when he he should be sitting there resting. So note that stuff. Put it in your notes. And you can assign. There's a common assessment scale. Bates and Jarvis and Seidel doesn't mention it, but uh, Bates is the board book that I like and I use. Uh, and yeah, so a normal is a plus two pulse. A weak is plus one. And plus three is called a bounding pulse. Bounding pulse. I hope we lost our ocean wave sound. Oh, well, I can survive. I don't hear any kids out there. It's like a playground outside my window, so I put that on to kind of dampen some of the noise. Uh, bounding pulse. So I like to ask you, what causes a bounding pulse? Why would the patient's pulse be cranky? And you say, are you sure you just didn't run around the block, Mrs. Jones? No, I've been sitting here quietly. What would cause that? Uh, so anxiety and fear, yeah, pro-exercise. I mean, these two aren't great ones. Don't. You know, I'm not going to ask you those. But some common things is thyrotoxicosis. Hyperthyroidism drives the heart really hard. And you can have a rapid and, and, and quite a, a pounding pulse because of hyperthyroidism. Uh, anemia. Blood that's thin doesn't oxygen weight well. So the heart has to pump harder and move the blood faster to make up for its uh, lack of ability to carry oxygen. Aortic insufficiency. Uh, can also do the trick where you have regurgitation in the aortic valve and you're getting too much blood in the heart. Um, so Frank Starling's law, anytime you have too much blood in the heart, the the muscles stretch and they contract harder than normal. So um, that can cause a bounding pulse. Like, for example, uh, we talked about, oh, I didn't turn on my markers, uh, but we talked about aortic aortic regurgitation a bit. Uh, so after systole occurs, the artery stretches and then it contracts to push blood downstream and backstream upstream to close the semilunar valves. Well, if the semilunar valves leak, you're getting blood coming, you're filling your left ventricle with blood from that direction and you're filling it normally from the other direction. Bottom line is you get too much blood in the ventricle. And so people like that could have a bounding pulse because every ejection has too much blood. Heart is overstretched. That will wreck your heart with the passage of time. Uh, you will get congestive heart failure and die from something like that if it isn't corrected. Um, kinetic states continued. Wet berry berry. I mean, we're not going to see that in this country, but it's an interesting mechanism. I'm sure she talks about that in... Uh, nutrition, uh, but it's interesting. You need vitamin B1 thiamine. Uh, we'll actually talk about the enzymes uh, in later. We'll do a tiny bit of biochemistry in, I think it's GIGU, uh, but there's a couple enzymes in the Krebs cycle that have to have vitamin B1 around or they don't work. And without vitamin B1 around, you start to build up your serum lactate levels and serum pyruvate levels. What do those two molecules do? They cause a significant decrease in peripheral resistance. They're vasodilators. So they pop open your microcirculation so wide that you have way too much blood coming back to the right side of the heart. And that's going to stretch out the right side of the heart. That's called preload. Right, you, you increase preload with this condition, and Frank Starling is in effect. If you stretch out your right 
ventricles, you're going to have a much more powerful contraction. You're going to inject blood through the lungs, and, and therefore you're going to get too much blood flowing into the left side of the heart. Therefore, you're going to have too forceful contractions and too much, too strong of blood going out of the heart. So you get a bounding pulse via that mechanism as well. On the opposite side of the coin, maybe the pulse, you can barely feel the darn thing. And so now what could cause, you're taking the radial pulse and you don't feel a great pulse, or you're taking the dorsalis pedis pulse and you don't feel a great pulse. What could be the cause? Uh, well, the first thing to do, is it bilateral problem or is it, is it a unilateral problem? If it's unilateral, they might have a beaver dam somewhere upstream. Let's say it's the left leg. Maybe their popliteal artery is uh, clogged up with thrombus, uh, f arterial thrombus formation. Or more likely, there's maybe a tumor. Or even more likely, there's atherosclerotic placking uh, up in, oh, let's say the external, external iliac artery is clogged up. So that's a big beaver dam. All your pulses downstream will be weak. So that's the way you got to think. You got to. That's why the first day I said it's so important to understand the direction of blood through flow through that system. Uh, another weird thing is called a congenital or is a congenital problem is called a coarctation of the aorta. Uh, this is exaggerated, but not exaggerated. I mean, there are ones that are this bad, where the tunica media is super massive and constrictive, and it literally acts as a beaver dam here. It compresses the artery down to nothing. These people, I do like to ask this question, should be more stars here, because these people, they will have, what do you think their blood pressure will be in the upper extremities? How's the pressure above the beaver dam? It's high, it's too high. And so they may have uh, a bounding or a strong, super strong pulse, where how do you think their pressure is in their lower extremity? What's their popliteal pulses? Maybe non-existent because they have such low blood flow. Um, so that's uh, coarctation. Uh, and uh, any beaver dam could up in this region could do this. But coarctation of the aorta is notorious congenital condition, notorious for causing upper extremity pulses too strong, lower extremity pulses too low. All right, uh, the femoral artery, actually you couldn't get my wife to do that one. Uh, she was nice enough to let me do the other one, so I'll be happy with that. Uh, but the femoral artery, of course, is about halfway between the ASIS and the pubic tubercle, right along the inguinal ligament, and there it is. Some authors say it's located about a third of the way. If you're driving a car from the pubic tubercle up to the ASIS, if you drive about a third of the way, that's where it is, and you drop down about a dime, two centimeters. That's where you palpate and auscultate for it. Um, so, yeah, that should be auscultated and it should be palpated for bruise, turbulent blood flow, thrills. If you remember turbulent blood flow, maybe you don't know this. You know what a brewery is, is turbulent blood flow that you can auscultate. Do you use the diaphragm or the bell? Always use the bell for a brewery, B and B, bell for brewery, for lower pitch sounds. Uh, but you can also palpate for turbulent blood flow, but you don't call it a brewery. I always kind of try to trick you with that question. Uh, if you feel turbulent blood flow, it feels like a cat purring on your uh, on your fingertips or your metacarpal phalangeal joints are even better. They're better at feeling vibration. Um, but that's called a thrill. It's not called, you don't palpate for brewies. You auscultate for, auscultate for brewies and you palpate for thrills. All right, there it is again. Um, this <laughs> Jarvis, can't believe Jarvis still uh, has this in here, but you don't ever want to do that, right? If you palpate, you got to drape the patient. In fact, I would have them cover their genitals up if you're going to be messing with this one. Can you just pull your, put your hand over your genitals so I don't accidentally uh, rub into that or touch into that area? Uh, don't do this. That's right from Jarvis, though which I don't like Jarvis, right? I don't use Jarvis because it's not a board book. I use Bates and Seidel. Anyway, so you put the patient supine and you you go about, you find the inguinal ligament, split the inguinal ligament and drop down about a dime. And if you're going to find it, that's the best place to find it. 
Um, we talked about breweries already. You can use the bell and listen there. Even if the brewery is upstream in the external iliac or even the common iliac artery, you, it'll still transmit that sound. You could still got a decent chance of hearing it with the bell. Uh, let's see. So popliteal, now we have video on this I'll attached to the end of this. Or I'm not sure if I'll upload it separately. Uh, but yeah, popliteal artery. Uh, this one be, can be tough the way some books say to do it. I really like Seidel's way of doing it. Uh, but So popliteal artery, of course, is a continuation of the femoral artery. It's best way to find it is right in the crack of the popliteal fossa you'll see where the skin crease is. And you, well, I'll show you how to do it. This is the classic way to do it. I think you might even know how to do it this way. Bates says to do it this way. So does Jarvis. Uh, you frog leg the patient like this, and you sink your index and middle fingers on each side deep into that crack. Uh, keep about a quarter inch between your fingers here. Push in and see if you can feel something. Really, I mean, I do this stuff all the time, right? So, uh, Really tough to find it like this, but look what Bates lets you do it a new way, or I'm sorry, Cedar lets you do it a new way. And now don't freak out because we're going to use your thumbs. And I know you're like, oh my God, I'm going to find my pulses are going to mess up. Your pulses are not going to mess interfere with this. So again, keep your about a quarter half inch apart. Uh, bend the knee slightly. Patient's face down, and push down. And push if you can't feel it. Use that. Push in really strong. Let the blood back up, and then slowly back off to make the blood squirt. But this is cool because not only can you feel it in your thumbs, but you can see it. Most of the time, you can see it pulsating right between your thumbs. So a visual, kind of a visual confirmation of this. Posterior tibial pulse is simple. Medial malleolus calcaneus, uh, if you go in that line and slip right off underneath the, I say two centimeters on the line going from here to here, um, that's where you find the posterior tibial pulse. You've got a decent chance of finding this one. I think it's 92%. Uh, Dorsalis pedis is uh, a different animal. It's the high 80s to find that. Right, posterior tibial. Make sure you don't do it on the lateral. People do that, you know, for back in school by then. Uh, it's not done. It's because that's not where Tom, Dick, and Harry live, right? That canal, tarsal tunnels, medial, underneath the medial malleolus. Dorsalis pedis is uh, tricky to find. So I'm not going to, I used to go on a big rant and roll about this. I'm going to try to calm down on this. Uh, because where is the dorsalis pedis? It is. Here's the crack of the ankle in this cadaver. You can have them dorsiflex. In fact, you should have them dorsiflex. That increases the chances. I think I forgot to do that in the video. Uh, but you've dorsiflex increases the chances of finding it. Then you have them pull their big toe to their nose, and that will kick off their extensor hallucis longus tendon and slip off at the crack, um, just a little bit just downstream from the crack, like right on the talus or not on the talus, really it's right on the navicular. Uh, and that's where your greatest chance is. There's a big ultrasound study done on this. Not very well done, I should say. Not very well written, but pretty well done. And your best chances of finding it are right here. Absolutely do not go down between your metatarsals and try to find it. For one, that's not the dorsalis pedis artery. Those are the metatarsal arteries and they lose their half power down here. There's an arcuate artery um, that you can just start to see here that goes into the deep arterial arch uh, on the plantar surface of the foot. So you lose half of the blood flow. So you have a terrible chance of finding it here, for one. And for two, it makes you look like you're not very smart when the examiner asks you to palpate the dorsalis pedis and you're not even on the dorsalis pedis artery. So stay up here at the crack of the artery. And by the way, that's how Bates says to do it. Right? So it's right here. It's not down here. So you're on the navicular. Uh, uh, there's an unnamed kind of prominent bump here. And that's where most of them are. If you can't find it, then go out lateral. Go even more lateral. Bates shows you, and Bates that shows you, that they went out even further to find it. 
uh, but always start right next to the extensor, extensor hallucis longus tendon, right at the crack of the ankle. The crack would be, this finger would be in the crack of the ankle. This finger would be on the talus. Got it? If you go down here, I'm not going to be happy with that. You're not going to do well on the exam. That's one of my pet peeves. All right, there's a guy doing it correctly. And there's just, again, I couldn't hamp, hamp, or help ranting a little bit. Just there's the anatomy, dorsalis pedis artery. It's right here. Uh, you can see there's an arcuate. Dorsalis pedis splits into an arcuate artery. And, that's, and, um, and then there's even another branch of it that goes off here. Uh, so down here, these are the metatarsal arteries, right? Dorsal metatarsal arteries. And I know some people are teaching you that, but don't do it. It's up here is where the dorsalis pedis. All right, awesome. Uh, let's, I have a video for you. And yeah, we'll see you. When will I see you? Oh yeah, big day tomorrow, right? I'll see you a lot tomorrow. A lot of videos. I have zero of them made, so I got a lot of work to do. I still have to do dermatology today. All right, take care. Take care, you guys.